Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming and welcome to um, today's uh, episode of the Development Studies Seminar Series. And we've got a, a bumper crop of speakers for you today. And it's very, very exciting. And we're launching this book that my great colleague Sarah and Jerry and others have been involved with, Global Activism and Humanitarian Disarmament. Um, my main job is to probably shut them up at various points so that we've got a lot to, to say and we want to leave room for you lot to ask questions. But I do want briefly to introduce our, our, our speakers and we will be beginning with Matthew Bolton, um, who I'll, I'll do the short version of the bio, if that's all right. And Matthew is a professor of political science and a co-director of the International Disarmament Institute at Pace University in New York City. Uh, he was involved in the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, ICANN. That was a team that he was involved in that was awarded the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize. He has a great deal of experience working not only in academia but also with the UN and with the NGOs and has gathered a lot of field experience from what Marshall Islands through to uh, Kiribati, Fiji, Cook Islands, earlier in Afghanistan, Bosnia, Cambodia, South Sudan, and Vietnam, and apparently is now working on the politics in a, in a, in a, a more than human world. Yeah, that sounds like another seminar topic. We'll do another time. But, but Matthew will talk for about 10, 15 minutes. We'll give him, give him a little bit extra about, about the book and its origins and approach. And then my colleagues Sarah and Jerry, Dr. Sarah and Jerry, will give a little background to the, the process of the book. Um, Sarah joined, has been with us uh, for, for not so long, but is a lecturer in humanitarianism and development here at SOAS. She's a long-term peace and conflict scholar uh, with a lot of involvement in mine action uh, and, and, and is doing a brilliant job of trying to kind of bring that world of the explosive remnants of, of warfare into closer contact with, with academia. Um, and, and she'll be followed by another SOAS colleague, Dan Plesch, over there, uh, who is Professor of Diplomacy and Strategy at SOAS. And apparently he's also something called a door tenant at a legal practice in Bedford Row. Um, and he can tell us what that, what that involves. Um, Dan has, has been putting out research, not only research for a long time, but research that's remarkably good at grabbing public attention internationally, which is fantastic um, on, on all our behalves, uh, and is currently focused on critical contemporary global issues um, broadly, including uh, corporate uh, accountability and so on and so forth. We are then very lucky to have Ricardo with us, another product of SOAS, both your LLM and, and, and your PhD, and I think currently a postdoc at SOAS too. Um, and Ricardo is International Policy Manager at Mines uh, Advisory Group, which is a humanitarian disarmament organization based in Manchester, um, which was co-awarded the Nobel Peace Prize earlier in 1997. And it reminds me that in the first year that we ran the Masters in Violence, Conflict and Development here at SOAS, more than two of you are taking that Masters, we were visited, our first crop of students for that master's was visited by a character called, a former soldier called Ray McGrath, who, who, who was the founder of mine advisory group and a very, very dynamic individual. So it's nice to bring that circle round. So um, Ricardo will bring that kind of practitioner and community engagement perspective to the discussion. Um, and then finally, we're very lucky to have with us uh, Mary Caldor who is Emeritus um, Professor of Global Governance and Director of the Conflict Research Program at the LSE, and amongst other things, has pioneered the ideas, the concepts of, of, of new wars and of global civil society. Um, she's the author of, of many things, including the book New and Old Wars, Organized Violence in a Global Era, uh, International Law and New Wars, and Global Security Cultures. And she has the amazing distinction of having examined my PhD a long time ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, 
I'm going to, and, and Mary will have a little bit longer than, than, than the others as well to speak, but I don't want to take up time, so I'm going to hand straight over to you, Matthew. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And you want to stand or you want to speak from there? It's entirely up to you. Thank you so much for the introduction and, and thank you all for coming to this, uh, this event. Um, our launch of this uh, book, Global Activism and Humanitarian Disarmament, uh, published by Palgrave. Um, and uh, I was asked to talk a little bit about the book, uh, about what it's about, about what humanitarian disarmament is about, and how the book came into being, right? Um, because sometimes we see these, um, you know, sort of packaged set of words um, and it's all very neat, and it's all been edited, but how, how, what's the kind of human story behind it? Um, I uh, came into this field of humanitarian disarmament that I'll define in a second, because it's a, a, a term that a lot of people are not that familiar with, um, through working as, as a humanitarian aid worker in uh, northern Bosnia um, shortly after the war, and it, the community that I was living in, Birch, the Birchko district, um, was particularly affected by, by mines and uh, explosive remnants of war. Um, and I found that to be such a compelling problem, uh, compelling in so many different ways, um, but particularly uh, as, a, as a literal reminder that the violence of the past kind of extended into the present and continued. Um, and I found the, it to be a really interesting uh, challenge of literally digging out violence from the from our setting um, and trying to m transform um, situations of conflict into a more uh, disarmed or peaceful setting I soon learned however that um, in that the politics of actually clearing those mines was deeply embedded in the whole political economy of the of the conflict itself um, and uh, that was a surprise uh, and a difficult one and a wake-up call that you couldn't just just get them out of the ground right there was a whole uh, complex of, of actors and vested interests who um, made things um, uh, difficult um, or wanted to profit from, from the removal of, of, of mines. And so that really compelled me, and I came to, the, to London to do my master's and PhD at the, at the LSE, and I'm very happy that um, Mary, who was my PhD supervisor, and Vesna, who was also my PhD supervisor, are here today. It feels like 20 years later, um, to be back in this spot is, is, is really quite marvelous. But what I examined was the politics of clearing those mines um, in Afghanistan and Bosnia and what was Sudan and now is Sudan and South Sudan. And I began to realize as I finished my PhD that this was actually um, a field that was not um, by itself. Just clearing mines was one part of a broader field a practice called humanitarian disarmament. Um, and humanitarian disarmament exists at the, the kind of nexus between humanitarianism, international law, diplomacy, and, um, and disarmament. Um, and it's a movement that a lot of people haven't really heard about, or if they have, they've heard like bits of it. So what's striking about it is in the, since 1996, it's achieved four major treaties um, of the landmine, Ban Treaty, the Cluster Munition Convention, um, the Arms Trade Treaty, and the uh, Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons in 2017. It's also had two Nobel Prizes, um, the, the, which were already uh, named, the, the International Campaign to Ban Landmines, and then the, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, or ICANN. Um, but those are often seen by the press as separate things. But many of the people who are involved in these campaigns um, are actually the same people, <laughs> wearing different hats in different times in different places, um, and they're overlapping circles. And so um, there, we, there are, in civil society, a kind of community of practice called humanitarian disarmament, but there almost had been no real academic coverage of it. There had been a few practitioners who'd written sort of academic adjacent articles. So this is the first book, actually, um, that comprehensively covers this field of humanitarian disarmament. Um, and we look at it from a variety of different points of view, um, from the view of um, its kind of approach to weapons. Um, as an approach, it is focused on 
um, a strong normative framing um, of weapons as a, a vector of harm, of humanitarian and uh, human rights and environmental harm, as opposed to a kind of classic security framing that you find in kind of in many traditional arms control negotiations. The focus is less on security per se and more about the, the, the suffering that, it, that weapons cause to civilians uh, as well as to soldiers, right? Um, they're also marked by strong pro prohibitions, so uh, banning, in the case of the Landmine Cluster Munition Nuclear Weapons Treaties, entire classes of weapons. Um, not with exceptions, they're not about controlling it, it's about stigmatizing um, uh, an entire weapon system as inhumane or indiscriminate, um, or both. Um, many of these tr uh, kind of, uh, it's for treaties, but there's also several other policy processes, have also prioritized remedial measures, um, which is symbolized by um, by Ricardo here, um, they, the, the approach to clearing mines, clearing cluster munitions, ad, environmental remediation of nuclear test sites, um, as well as victim assistance and risk uh, education. So linking not just what do, how do we uh, prohibit weapons and, and their spread, but also how do we do justice to those people who've been affected by those those weapons. And that that has been a real I kind of I think policy innovation of this field to make sure that you don't take the testimony and the images of victims and survivors and tokenize them um, to a sort of political legitimation for some um, you know, weapons process, but you actually do something for the people who are most affected. And then finally, a kind of normative framing. So um, arms control has traditionally focused on verifying um, instruments through surveillance, through control, through spying on each other, um, through kind of punitive measures. And many of the humanitarian disarmament instruments don't actually operate that way. They work through what's sometimes called cooperative compliance, where the assumption is if you're part of the treaty, you're there in good faith. Um, and so there's a, a, a kind of project management or problem-solving approach to um, destroying um, landmines, for instance, or cluster munitions. The assumption is these are bad weapons, so you don't want to keep them around, rather than these are weapons that give you power, and so you want to hide them away from from, from everyone. And so this is actually developed into a community of practice. There are several NGO campaigns around it, so kind of advocacy people. There are also operators, the, the, the organizations that do the demining, that um, provide victim assistance in the field, and also a growing number of diplomats who have kind of come into contact with it um, and have kind of adopted a humanitarian disarmament identity. Um, and you see sometimes the same diplomats being posted um, to negotiate, um, you know, multiple uh, um, treaties. And so, finally, the the process that has emerged that has driven this is um, a close collaboration between civil society and often the diplomats of what IR scholars sometimes call middle powers or small states. Those small states don't like to be called small states. Um, they're they just we prefer you call them states, um, but nonetheless, uh, a focus on states that are not the, the big powers, right? The big military powers, and and um, essentially trying to do an end run around the, the states that are the main problem, in the sense that you don't need to when you are um, trying to deal with, um, you know, uh, murder. You don't bring the murderers in the room <laughs> to discuss how we're going to regulate their behaviour, but instead, kind of incorporating states that are broadly in compliance with norms to be the ones that innovate it. So our book um, tries to summarize that uh, story that I've just told you um, and then examine it from three different points of view. We look at the emergence of norms. Where do these norms come from? How do they get into the policy arena? We look at religious actors. We look at um, uh, kind of international lawyers and, and advocacy people. We look at scientists who are often, and technical experts, who are often called to be the kind of voice of what's possible um, and, and have the, this difficult process of trying to find out what it's like to be a scientist and political at the same time, which many scientists find very um, unnerving. Um, and everyone else does too. <laughs> and then we also look at what happens when these norms emerge how do they get diffused into policy processes and implemented? So how does the cluster munition treaty um, affect 
the states like the United States that are not part of the treaty, but nonetheless have to adjust their policy um, to it. Um, to the implementation of landmine clearance in very complicated political settings, which Sarah will talk about. And then finally, the wider context. So how does humanitarian disarmament fit within the broader context of uh, global policy making in general, um, and also within the specific context of disarmament and arms control, and Dan will talk about, about that. So we're really excited that this exists in the world. Um, it had some difficult times, uh, like getting launched during the pandemic, but here we are, it exists, and um, I'm so excited that we have a panel who can uh, discuss various aspects of humanitarian disarmament in this book. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, again, uh, thank you Matthew for guiding us uh, through the, the process of putting this book together. I thought I would also start with the, with, with the human story of how the book came about or how I even came about into the Landmines campaign. I worked uh, as Matthew uh, as a humanitarian um, uh, person, uh, aid worker in, in Nairobi and uh, worked with an organization called the Jesuit Refugee Service that, uh, uh, that worked in the region, in the Eastern African region. And over time, we realized that there were, we were serving refugees who were crossing borders, who, who were maimed and, and, and needing specialized uh, um, assistance. And it became policy for, this, for the organization that we, we engage in the landmines campaign and I became the de facto person who was uh, doing uh, landmines engaging uh, at the time. And, and hence uh, campaigning, then coming over to England to do my, uh, my M MA and, and, and then my PhD, and here I, write, I am today. So the, the, the book itself came about from uh, an, an international um, uh, studies association uh, panel in Baltimore in 2017. Um, and of, of course, three years later, then we, we had the publication that came uh, during COVID. And the process was led and, 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 and led. And it, it, I think that what I want to emphasize here was the collaboration between early career researchers. I'd just finished my PhD and, and, and Taylor, the, co the other co-editor, had also finished their PhD. And we approached Matthew and said, you know, could we get this published? And he, 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 he facilitated that process. And it is a beautiful collaboration of, uh, you know, academics who, uh, you know, senior academics and early career researchers uh, uh, going together. And the, the collaboration continues. We are re-engaging again in, in, a, in a book uh, uh, called Reinvigorating Disarmament. So um, the collaborations uh, also with, uh, with practitioners uh, has seen me take over from Matthew in, in terms of uh, being a trustee of an organization that uh, is called is, uh, CEOBS, uh, Conflict and Environmental Observatory, which is an organization that's looking at the environmental impact of, of, uh, of war and, and the humanitarian consequences of conflict. And they're doing this through research. So he, he stepped down and I, I took over from that. The, the practitioner collaboration uh, uh, still continues. Now to my chapter. I, 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 my chapter comes under the section of the volume that discusses the difficulties with civil society actors working to advance the humanitarian, um, the humanitarian um, pardon me, the humanitarian consequences of conflict and military activities. And, and uh, with the success of the mind ban movement, as, as, as we mentioned, uh, came the, the, a, 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 a whole new sector within the humanitarian uh, sector. And this was the mine action sector that looks at clearance or addressing the consequences of, of explosive remnants of war. As the chapter is based on my PhD uh, uh, research, so it's quite specific uh, for the time that I'm looking at. It addresses, it looks at how uh, it, uh, the, the approach to, to the PhD was looking, uh, examining, uh, having a critical examination of the implementation of mine action programs in, in, in difficult contexts like Somalilands, and I used a peace building, liberal peace building lens. 
I noted in the, in, that the way in which mine action was being implemented globally and, and, and locally uh, in Somaliland reflected some dominant uh, critiques of liberal peace building that they were mainly externally led, uh, mainly uses technical or templates, uh, technical approaches. Also, it fails or disregards local context and therefore fails to build uh, uh, ownership. These attributes, uh, the, uh, the critiques argue, lead to uh, failure or limited success of peace building interventions. However, uh, this, is, this is a critique that I contend with, uh, and, 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 but only to a certain point, because I argue that, uh, or my research established that while these attributes did actually contribute to the challenges of implementing mine action programs, and thereby limiting the peaceability uh, potential for, for mine action. And I use the, the, the term peaceability. I borrowed it from work that Jonathan Good had, had done many years <laughs> ago, and I think I recently met and I was mentioning that. And it's not been published anywhere. I, I found uh, the report in, a, in an old archive, and you use the, uh, the, the peaceability uh, idea, and I thought it was, it was a brilliant one to borrow. So uh, that actually the, the modalities of implementing does do reduce the peaceability potential for mine action. But uh, that there was more to it, uh, they, they, that there was more beyond the implementation modalities, and this is mainly about context. And the context I was looking at was Somaliland. It was an unrecognized entity, and therefore that explained a lot of the challenges. So the article, in, uh, in the article, I argue that Somaliland mine action is really caught within a very specific trap that is shaped by its lack of, uh, the lack of international legal status. Programmatically, uh, to treat Somaliland as a state uh, would be seen as political and thus, therefore, um, require a political, uh, and, and also that would challenge the, the political non-neutral non -neutr non process. So it would be a political non-neutral process, sorry. Similarly, mine action is also being understood as a part of a broader policy framework of DDR, the, uh, the demilitarization, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration framework. This framework places more Sec, uh, you know, emphasis on security rather than sustainable development or humanitarian dimensions of mine action. So by framing mine action this way, the UN had conceptualized it in, uh, in a limiting way as a disarmament arms, uh, uh, and, and uh, arms management program. This meant that mine action was never uh, evaluated holistically. So all the evaluation reports that I looked at, none included mine action because it was always, you know, left out of. Uh, of. So the lessons uh, that were to be learned there were, were missed, and and to demonstrate, uh, and therefore the issues uh, issues that the UN itself aspires to 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 address, which include local capacity building and creating local ownership, were not were not being achieved, and they were being neglected. And to illustrate that, I have two brief examples. Maybe I'll do one, and then uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share another one during Q&A. So the, the, the way the UN approaches my, uh, uh, mine action uh, or envisages uh, engaging with mine action is three, through three different operational scenarios of implementation. A humanitarian intervention, and this is in instances where the national authorities are unable or willing, are unwilling to address the problem. And, and a mission is established by the Security Council, and uh, in, in such a scenario, the department then, uh, the Department of Peacekeeping and, 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 and uh, operation, Peacekeeping Operations would, would take the lead. Uh, the other second scenario is a presence of an effective national government. <laughs> then in that scenario, UNDP or UNICEF takes the lead. The third scenario, is uh, where emergency, where there is an emergency, and therefore the need for a rapid response, short-term intervention. Then the United Nations Mine Action Service takes the lead. Somaliland doesn't fit all these, uh, uh, pre, uh, you know, coordination models. So it's an unrecognized entity. So in a in a sense, there is no government uh, in in the eyes of or in the in in as 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 conceptualized by 
uh, the UN. And they, therefore, the UN uh, uh, could not establish a national capacity building relationship. There is no government to establish uh, a capacity building relationship. There is not a peacekeeping mission uh, with a mandate to establish a mine action program. And neither is it classified as a humanitarian context under the authority of the humanitarian coordinator and therefore part of a, 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 and therefore part of a development program under a UN resident uh, coordinator. Yet, uh, in Somaliland, uh, what I found out then was that uh, UNDP initially supported uh, the program, a political decision, one might argue. Somaliland already at the time had uh, a national demining agency uh, set up by the government, you know, that, that had taken, uh, that, that had established itself after the war. And uh, they'd, they'd set that up under the Ministry of Rehabilit Resettlement, Rehabilitation, and Reconstruction. And their view, with the view of re-engaging re or re reintegrating ex-combatants into society. Uh, what UNDP did was uh, then uh, create a, a completely different entity. And this was because they were guided by their approach of, of, of neutrality, a humanitarian endeavor. So some, you know, from uh, looking at that, some uh, people saw that as a, a complete, dis a deliberate uh, act of disrespect of existing uh, institutions. Uh, UNDP had, you know, a, a disassociated uh, helping or offering assistance. Uh, 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 sorry, they, they disassociated itself from the National Demining Authority because of the, the, the neutrality uh, principle, yet Surprisingly, they had engaged uh, Zimbabwean uh, ex-combatants from Zimbabwe to, uh, uh, to come in and clear mines in Somaliland. That was quite, uh, quite interesting. So maintaining that neutrality was therefore in conflict with their own uh, stated uh, agenda of cooperating and with building uh, capacity. And as a result, there was a disagreement with the UN. Uh, the Somaliland government was, was quite uh, adamant that they were not going to engage with the, with the new entity, the Somaliland Mine Action. And, and, and the coordination suffered uh, immensely. And it led to, to both these institutions being ineffective and, and lacking a clear division of responsibilities and a clear mandate. I think I've run out of time. Um, Just about. I can, I can have another minute. Great. So that was uh, quite, you know, and for a very long time, uh, talking to the UN people at the time uh, when I was doing the field work, nobody knew, nobody could tell me for certain this is the lead organization that, that, uh, that's uh, coordinating mine action. Uh, the different UN people had different UN cards, uh, and, and it was, yeah, so the, it was a bit problematic, and the impasse between the, the government and, 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 and SMAC, uh, uh, Somaliland Mine Action, uh, just uh, continued. Then the other way, the other example is the way in which uh, the UN-led mine action conceptualizes or organizes uh, uh, their, their, their entry. It, they use a very outdated uh, develop uh, what you call emergency development continuum, which assumes conflict, uh, post-conflict, peace building, and then development. And that's, I think, uh, up to today, that's the same approach that is used in mine action. This assumes that there is a straightforward, you know, movement from war to peace, uh, and nothing in, you know, in between. With situations, you know, situations that are defined uh, emergency, it could be argued that it's an excuse for short-term uh, responses uh, and, and, and long-term implications for interventions is no less important in, in this case. So um, for an approach, for such an approach to be very, to be successful, Operationalizing uh, these programs would require a comprehensive uh, analysis of the context-related risks, vulnerabilities, and, and capacities. Yet applying such an approach to Somaliland as an unrecognized uh, state would be difficult uh, for the impartial, neutral UN. So um, to conclude, uh, the, this ambiguity complicates the UN kind of framing. Uh, of the context within that idealized uh, linear path uh, and the underlying assumptions about statehood. 
to conclude, I argued, I, I argued more generally on, on, about my, my, on the, on the uh, research itself and, and on particular, this particular chapter that I wrote, I argued for uh, the, the need for a nuanced uh, critique that uh, acknowledges the challenging realities of implementing programs in challenging post-conflict environments. And there are so many other examples uh, within uh, the chapter, so you're welcome to read. And, uh, and please get a copy of my thesis, which is not uh, out in, as a book yet, and hopefully the next book launch will be a, about that. Thank, Thank you very much. Well, it's a fantastic book. I hope there are already lots in the library. Um, and if not, you can uh, put them on your birthday list. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here with such a, uh, a distinguished group. And um, when we were on a panel um, at uh, ISA and uh, Matt and Sarah uh, asked me to join uh, I, with my colleague, Kevin Letic, who could not be here, um, was overjoyed to uh, join the project. Um, I have to say I feel um, particularly excited and slightly overawed uh, with the panel today to uh, have Mary Caldor with us uh, because when I was, I guess, the average age of most people in this room, uh, I was a banner-waving protester uh, and it was Mary on the platform addressing crowds happily then in the hundreds of thousands uh, along with Edward Thompson as we were campaigning uh, against uh, uh, exterminism, the politics of exterminism, which sadly are back with us, and I'm sure Mary will give her, us, uh, her views on that in, in a short while. Um, my own experience started off as a banner waver, and hey, here you are, give me a banner waver and end up a professor. Uh, <laughs> along the way, uh, I was involved in uh, international NGO coalitions that helped produce the test ban treat, nuclear test ban treaty, landmines, small arms, a number of others of these international uh, coalitions. Um, and... Uh, I guess in some ways I was a, a political refugee from the decline of those movements and managed to escape into uh, academia uh, as a sort of political bolt hole and happy to be so at SOAS, which is um, renowned for helping develop uh, creative, disruptive um, ideas in many fields, not least in insecurity. Um, I think we just need to be extremely clear that without disarmament movements, we'd all be dead. That without the movements of the 1960s and the 1980s in particular, the politics of exterminism, of toxic, uh, militarised masculinity, which uh, is present in all societies, but particularly in a nuclear-armed world, has a devastating uh, potential, would have overrun us. Um, and it was uh, the mass protests uh, and expert opinion or particularly of those eras, that meant we had another breathing space. And yet the warnings, uh, although people seem remarkably sanguine, from the building of the Atomic Scientists, from Oppenheimer, the movie, etc., uh, are that we are back in that uh, critical situation. But as yet, we haven't really seen the necessary political and public reaction, and perhaps we can take a step or two in that direction um, this evening. Those movements, uh, democratic uh, and important, perhaps lead up one slight garden path, which is the idea that this is all uh, Western and necessarily democratic. Um, under the shoguns, uh, Japan uh, outlawed gunpowder for more than 200 years. Uh, in 1600, uh, Japan was fighting wars with gunpowder like the Europeans were. But in that closed political space, one has to say, the political leadership decided that uh, the impact on society, on the elite society of the samurai, of gunpowder, was too devastating. And they went back to swords. Uh, so when people say you can't disinvent it, there is a, you know, a great uh, example. Uh, when we talk about uh, democratic movements and treaties and humanitarianism, let's not forget that the first Hague Conventions, uh, which we now look back on as fundamental in uh, outlawing ungentlemanly war... <laughs> Um, were convened by the Tsars of Russia uh, at their initiative, not known for their enlightened policies. So the idea that this is all necessarily a, 
uh, Western uh, and democratic isn't one that we should feel trapped by. Um, in the same way as in more recent years, one of the critical decisions on women and peace and security at the United Nations uh, was led not by Western NGOs and uh, foundations, which sometimes like to take the credit, but by Namibia. Um, and by women in Namibia who had come out of the struggle in Southwest Africa and wanted to lead global policy in that arena. So uh, if we feel that this is just a Western invention or somehow trapped by that construction, we shouldn't be. And I think those ideas you see coming through in chapter after chapter of the book that uh, Matt and, uh, and Sarah uh, pulled together. And for uh, that reason alone, I think it's a, uh, a very important addition to uh, scholarship about international uh, peace and security. Um, when we think of uh, the Western movements on uh, humanitarianism and, and disarmament, uh, absolutely, we need to evaluate uh, and treasure uh, the treaties that uh, Matt outlined um, so well. But let's not forget that in 1915, at the height of the First World War, 1,500 women came together in The Hague and created what we now know as the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And for them, humanitarian disarmament meant directly addressing the weapons of World War I. Um, no idea to call them conventional. And to some extent, the tragedy of our own agenda is that the tanks, guns, and missiles that we see killing people every day on television aren't the focus of any parts of civil society, really, except for this little project that I'm engaged in. But those movements, although they didn't stop a second world war and the arms control that came afterwards, uh, did have some very important and tangible results that we can build on. Our uh, logo for this project um, is a, a, of a uh, Hiroshima bomb fired from a, fired from a cannon. Uh, and at the time I was uh, listening to Mary's speeches in the 1980s, there were literally thousands of these stockpiled either side of the east-west border in Europe. Thousands of them. And it was only because of pressure that they were uh, got rid of. And indeed, when we look at the armies of Ukraine, Gaza and the like, not only are they not equipped with uh, Hiroshima bombs routinely, and they don't exist in really any country's inventory anymore, thank goodness, our success, but also chemical weapons. Maybe there are horrors in Syria enough, but chemical weapons at one point were also there to be fired from these sorts of cannon. And it was because of public pressure and to a degree, you know, more enlightened parts of, of our elites that they were got rid of. So you shouldn't necessarily look at the world around us and think that the that progress is impossible, that it's all intangible. It is very tangible. Great things can be uh, achieved. And this book outlines in many ways uh, how we as individuals and organizations can uh, come together. Right now, I think we do need new global initiatives. Much of the work that is in this book um, arises from the optimistic idea that major war between states was a thing of the past after the Cold War. And therefore, we should focus on the weapons that were killing people today, quite rightly. And at that time, it was true. Landmines, small arms, cluster munitions were doing the damage. But you only have to turn on the television today and you can see that we have returned to bad old ways. And we need an agenda that gets to grips with, um, <coughs> with those new old, old threats. And one way, and hopefully you'll join us in our campaign, uh, is to have a two-month session of the UN devoted to new disarmament initiatives to, um, in our day when I was following Mary and, and Edward's leadership, uh, they argued presciently that if we challenge the weapons, politics would change. The block system would, would change and crumble and new ideas would come forward. And that is indeed exactly what happened. In the end, the powers that be, Reagan Gorbachev, took our demand for zero missiles off of our banners and it ended up in a treaty because of our pressure. We need to do the same now. We need to be asking for, I think, zero missiles, whether it's in the Red Sea or Gaza or Ukraine. We need to have a, a concept that simple and powerful to help our, us mobilize. And in doing so, 
and I hope you will uh, think of joining us in doing that, you can have no better place to start than this volume, which provides a, a series of chapters uh, looking at uh, the how uh, and the why and the organisation uh, to be your, uh, your guidebook and, and your manual. And I hope you will use that and work with us so that we can uh, stay alive. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you, thank you very much. I was uh, I was keeping my finger crossed that we would have kept the conversation on the <laughs> on the armchair, not on the podium. But <laughs> I'll I'll follow the I'll follow the, the the practice. And thank you very much for for this invitation. I'm very happy, uh, very happy to be here to speak about this brilliant brilliant book. Um, I'm not an author. I am <laughs> I haven't participated to the writing of this book, but uh, I, I'm glad to say that uh, I, I am a reader of that book. And uh, I want to really, to really say to, um, um, to really emphasize what uh, Matthew said uh, at the beginning, that uh, this is actually a much needed book. We ho I hope that it's going to be just at the beginning, like also Sarah <laughs> was saying, because uh, in general, and, and, and then I, I'll speak a little bit uh, about MAG in particular, Minds Advisory Group. In general, we do say that, I would like to say that the humanitarian disarmament movement uh, has been, uh, I would say, has been really fast, especially you now in the, in, the, in, the, in the last decades. And uh, it has the, there has been a, a development of... Uh, uh, the community of practice that Matthew w was saying that uh, has developed uh, a lot of expertise, knowledge, uh, lived experience involving also uh, survivors from different uh, from different uh, from different conflict as well as well as then survivors uh, becoming, for example, D miners as well. But it's really it's really worth uh, worth. Uh, uh, having that history studied, researched, even uh, uh, approached in a in a critical way, um, like uh, uh, just to refer to what uh, Sarah was saying earlier, I mean definitely uh, the. Um, the example that Sarah was uh, w was highlighting it's defi definitely a misreading of the humanitarian of the humanitarian principles because neutrality is supposed to be. A, an instrumental principle where the principle of humanity is actually the 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 the, the, the drive the driving one. So if neutrality is actually put <laughs> as at the top uh, against uh, every kind of uh, traditional <laughs> definition uh, uh, of the humanitarian principle, that that's actually uh, a bit problematic. And I, it's good that uh, someone like Sarah <laughs> actually flagged that. <laughs> Like that out. Thank you, Sarah, for doing that. Um, okay, so um, I'm going like like uh, like I was I was introduced. I'm an international policy manager at uh, Mines Advisory Group. Um, my work uh, my work is uh, to uh, is like uh, like a I would say a diplomat slash researcher for the organization. I one of my main tasks is to. Uh, facilitate uh, the, the bridging between uh, our programs on the ground that uh, right now currently are more than we have more than 30 program active programs around the world for about uh, for about more than uh, 6000 uh, uh, member members of staff um, and uh, what uh, we are really proud of uh, in uh, in mag is that uh, we want to uh, practice policy influence but based on evidence, so based on the needs and the views that we, uh, we've, we that my colleagues, my colleagues on the f in the field for we, to which I'm very great, I'm very grateful, and I hope someone is is he <laughs> listening to listening to me. But without their everyday work, I couldn't be here talk, uh, talking to you. So I really have to uh, mention this. But basically, what we want to do is to. Uh, what we aim to do in the policy in the policy team uh, in in mag is to bridge that gap uh, bringing evidence evidence based 
uh, informed policy to the fora in Geneva and new, in relevant fora, Geneva and New, new York mainly, and, and facilitate the meaningful participation of uh, a vast range of uh, stakeholders that tend to, for many different reasons, tend to kind of remain uh, at the margin, unfortunately, so ranging from national national authorities, uh, civil society, uh, civil society in uh, in affected in affected countries, um, and uh, and and other and, and civil society broadly speaking. Just to give you uh, an idea, I was thinking that uh, uh, you heard the terms "mine action" a lot, so I would really like to kind of give you a little bit of a. Uh, of a snapshot. Right now, it is estimated that there are about 60 million of 60 million people living under threat uh, of landmines or other explosive remnants remnants of war. Uh, explosive remnants of war. Uh, uh, I usually define them as, uh, unfortunately, quantity of explosive that, for some reasons, landed up in an in an area. Or was in, was in place was in place intentionally during during a conflict and remain active uh, remain active uh, remain active on the ground and be uh, remaining active on the ground because it's a cluster munition that didn't explode or sub munition sorry or a landmine that uh, wasn't activated or a, a, a bomb that didn't didn't explode didn't explode it means that remaining active. It means that they can be they they are usually activated by their their own victims. So, uh, and just to give you another uh, sad snapshot, in only in only 2022, according to the Landmine Monitor, we had uh, uh, four four thousand one hundred and seventy casualties from landmines of the, or explosive remnants of war, and uh, I, three four three fourths of of them are actually people who uh, remain injured from the accident. And the reason why I want to highlight the fact that uh, we have much more injuries, that, uh, injuries than, uh, than, uh, uh, than, than death, not, not, to minimize, not to minimize the death, that they have serious, serious consequences for the family, uh, for the family uh, most of all of the, of the deceased. But you can imagine that uh, having a, what what can be the consequ the consequences of uh, remaining inju injured from uh, from such an act from such an accident? It means, uh, on the one hand, the tra trauma, physical 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 conditions, trauma, psychological conditions that basically expand the shadow of the conflict. So even even people that uh, uh, are supposed to live uh, in a peace in a, in in peace. Uh, because uh, because a, a peace agreement was signed or a truce was was was, was established, they still live they still live under this under this threat. So what happens? Uh, there is this field called uh, humanitarian mine action that uh, has uh, has a series of pillars: uh, risk education, clearance, uh, stockpile destruction, um, victim assistance, and advocacy. Uh, I feel that risk education is probably the one that uh, is less less intuitive. It re it means uh, it's the most uh, emergent. It's the the one most of the time is the one that can only be delivered during emergency situation and during active conflict. It means basically uh, warn the population of the risk of uh, of uh, of explosive remnants of war and how to behave around explo explos explosive remnants of war. Uh, during active conflicts, this is uh, probably the only the only one that can be delivered for different reasons. First, for access, because I mean, uh, humanitarian humanitarian mine action operators like MAGA cannot access, cannot safely access uh, zones of uh, active conflict. But then, at the same time, according to the humanitarian <laughs> according to the humanitarian principles that are supposed to guide the to guide the operations of humanitarian uh, humanitarian disarmament operators like MAG, uh, removing a landmine, you can uh, you can uh, safely you can safely assume that that it's something that it can be seen as uh, an active participation in can be can be seen as a, a active participation in hostilities, which is prohibited by the by the principle of <laughs> the principle of neutrality. So we need to find ways to. Uh, 
address the humanitarian consequences during active conflicts in a in, a, in other ways, when a conflict has uh, has terminated, has terminated, uh, or as yeah, the, the active hostilities are not uh, taking place anymore, what happens is uh, uh, that uh, we we start to we start to enter through the organizations, the agencies that uh, Sarah mentioned earlier, but also through NGOs like uh, Minds Advisory Group that were actually the novelty uh, of the humanitarian disarmament. Um, disarmament uh, process so the fact that we we started to have uh, uh, NGO civil society civil society op operate operators that actually uh, provide the tech provide the humanitarian technical assistance to uh, to either prevent or address the harm the harm of um, landmines cluster cluster submunitions and other explosive remnants of war um, so uh, I want to uh, focus because I think it's something relevant also for what Matthew and uh, uh, yes <laughs> Matthew and Sarah just uh, just mentioned uh, in uh, in Mag uh, our approach we are really proud that uh, uh, a, an important part of our approach is on uh, building sustainable national capacity in line with, uh, with the framework as outlined by the humanitarian disarmament treaties, the one that Matthew listed, especially the anti-personal mine ban convention of 1997 and the cluster munition convention of 2008 that specifically, uh, specifically attributes the responsibility, the responsibility to national institutions to address this uh, these issues and uh, and this uh, uh, and this actually doesn't only mean uh, a burden on national authorities but also actually means a respect of uh, the sovereignty of the, the the state the state that is trying to actually move away from the situation of the situation of uh, uh, of conflict or this long wave long wave of long term effects um, the, the other, the other important, the other important, the other important thing is that uh, we work with uh, with uh, with uh, affected states also to kind of uh, um, put uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, transcend the traditional uh, models of international cooperation. So not only the, the not only the typical north to south cooperation, but like for example the south to south cooperation approach, which basically means uh, building on the expertise that a lot of states have developed during, during the, their dealing with, uh, their dealing with uh, explosive remnants of war, which I think it's very important because it actually expands uh, and legitimizes a, a lot of actors in uh, these uh, communi communities of practice that Matthew was was mentioning and it, this is very important and, and here I, I want to conclude because uh, uh, in the, the in the humanitarian disarmament process it's a process it's an it's a um, it's a continu a continuous process and that's also why this book uh, it's very important because you you are actually flagging up uh, actors with uh, with uh, with agency with agency and uh, 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 reaching a point where we have a stigma, we have an understanding that uh, anti-personal landmines have no military utility because the impact on civilians is basically unacceptable. It's very important. It's an achievement to, to, to guard, but it's also in a, uh, something to expand further and always to keep, uh, to keep, uh, uh, to keep the, guard, <laughs> the guard high that uh, the, 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 the kind of... Uh, we don't have uh, rolls back into... Uh, actors that are claiming that uh, inhumane weapons have a certain military, certain military utility. Especially, we we hope we don't want to to, to go back to what we have already mm -hmm. fixed on tre on treaties uh, and on practice. So, thank you very much for this book. Uh, it's much it's much needed, and thank you very much again for this invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, many congratulations on the book. I think it's really important to, that it draws attention 
to a type of disarmament that's different from arms control, which was the dominant model, which was really about managing relations between the superpowers. It's much more focused on human beings, and that's why it's so important. And the second aspect is, of course, your focus on global activism and the important role of civil society. So I think for both those reasons, the book makes a really significant contribution. I thought I'd make a couple of comments about the book and then say a little bit about how do we go forward in this horrible situation where none of this humanitarian disarmament seems at all possible at the moment. So the first point is really echoing what Dan was saying, which is that I'm quite uncomfortable with the term humanitarian. I know that these treaties are described as humanitarian, but the problem with international humanitarian law has always been from the beginning that it is actually a way of legitimizing war. It's a way of saying we can fight wars that are not horrible. And actually, all the wars that get fought, even with conventional weapons, even if they don't use poison gas or uh, landmines, are really horrible. I mean, it, it's very striking to me the way bombing somehow seems to be acceptable. That's what we're seeing in Gaza today. And one of the things I always think went wrong was that Nuremberg was really Victor's justice. And the war crimes committed by the Allies in the bombing of Dresden, the bombing of Hamburg, the bombing of Tokyo, and worse than anything, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, were never subjected to legal cases. And the result is that bombing has somehow become acceptable. And it's unbelievable the way Israel goes on claiming it's not breaching international humanitarian law, it's not doing forced displacement. So, you know, I would love us to have humanitarian disarmament around bombing and to try to build a kind of justification against that. So I think there's a problem. I'd be much happier, and I'll come back to that in a minute, with the term human security. And if you talk about, they are sometimes called the human security treaties because the countries that were engaged in them are all part of something called the human security network. And then you can add into that, which I think is really relevant, the International Criminal Court. So it's not just about disarmament, it's about human security. That's a term I would prefer. And I, I have a... Well, I'd just like to, in order to explain what human security is, most people know it's about the security of the individual and the communities in which they live rather than the, the security of the state. But one way of thinking about it is to contrast it with international humanitarian law. So in international humanitarian law, the killing of civilians is permitted provided it's necessary for the military objective and is proportionate to the gains that would be achieved by achieving the military objective. And that's the argument on which Israel bases its justification. I think in human security, the killing of enemies is permitted only if it's necessary for the protection of civilians. <laughs> So it turns that argument totally on its head and it means that killing civilians in order to kill enemies is completely prohibited. And I often think a very good example of this was Northern Ireland because <laughs> for all Britain's faults, and there were many <laughs> in what happened in Northern Ireland, the problem was that because the people of Belfast were British citizens, we couldn't bomb the IRA. And that meant that the role of the military had to be to protect civilians first and foremost. They could send special forces after the IRA, but it was a very different, but very different from bombing them, from going to war with them. So that's the first point I wanted to make about human security. And then the second point I wanted to make really was 
to, about civil society. I mean, Dan mentioned the demonstrations in the 1980s. And I think that uh, the real, the period from 68 to 89 really was a period of mass mobilization. And what we saw after 89, after the end of the Cold War, was, if you like, the institutionalization of social movements. And that's what these civil society activities were all about. You know, if you look at the history of, of how we became more peaceful domestically, it has actually always been the consequence of social movements and all the nonviolent mechanisms that we've developed in our societies, uh, law courts, uh, elections, <laughs> committees, <laughs> They've all been the outcome of civil society pressure. They've, in a way, been the institutionalization of social movements. And I feel what was the real significance of 1989, even though there'd been a history, and Dan was telling us about the Women's International League of Peace and Freedom, there'd been a history of civil society effort. The real significance of the 1989 revolutions was that civil society became seen as a, became global. That was the real significance. And it's very interesting because, you know, at the time, everybody said these were weird revolutions. They just wanted to be like the West and there were no new ideas. And I'd been very involved in the whole story and I'm gonna tell you a little bit in, about that. Um, and I kept thinking, but there were lots of new ideas. But the new ideas were really about the things we're talking about. They were about civil society, human rights, the new international discourse. So how did that international discourse came about? Well, Dan was saying we thought the missiles could make a difference. But actually, the key thing about European nuclear disarmament, which me and Edward Thompson were part of, is that we came to the conclusion that the way to get nuclear disarmament was to end the Cold War. And so we deliberately, from the beginning, decided to start a dialogue with the human rights groups in Eastern Europe, the people who were opposing communism. And so our argument was, actually, uh, pressure for disarmament provides more space for democracy because the Soviet Union uses the Western threat as a reason for oppressing East Europeans. <laughs> and by the same token, more democracy makes disarmament more likely because uh, the West uses the argument of Soviet oppression to justify the acquisition of weapons. So that was our kind of argument, and by supporting each other, we sort of strengthened each other because the peace movement had always been considered an arm of the Soviet Union and could be marginalized as fellow travelers. And the East European human rights were always seen as a Western fifth column and equally could be marginalized. But by linking up together, it became really, really difficult, especially in Eastern Europe, to marginalize the groups. But more important, debating these issues, and there were lots of arguments, lots of disagreements, I won't go into the details, really helped us develop a new language. And people may not be aware of the fact that the term civil society was hardly used in the West before 1989. It was the East Europeans that drew our attention to the importance of civil society, the importance of what they called anti-politics, the importance, as Havel said, of living according to your conscience, anti-politics. So we kind of developed a whole new language about, pa at that time, pan-European civil society, and it was the coming together of peace and human rights. And I think that was the language which people seized on after 1989, particularly the international community and created that moment in the 1990s when we had great progress with all these treaties, but not sufficiently great progress, 
to prevent what happened afterwards. What happened afterwards, I think, uh, from 2001 onwards, from the from 9-11 and the coming to power of Putin in Russia, was that the old Cold War structures reared their heads again. <laughs> we hadn't got rid of the old Cold War structures. And I think that's brought us to where we are today. So I think these treaties are very much a product of their time of the 90s, but nevertheless, they do have their own momentum despite everything. Uh, we're seeing a huge emphasis on international law in the wars in Ukraine and Gaza, much bigger than we've seen in previous wars. We're seeing an emphasis on the role of crime and so on. So I think it's still there and that's what we have to build on. So let me turn to the situation now, which is really grim <laughs> and really deeply depressing. I mean, I think we're in a situation where the US has just lost legitimacy and we've lost uh, not only legitimacy, but there's a loss of belief in American power. You know, when America goes off and strikes the Houthis, we know very well it's not going to stop the Houthis. So what is it? It's a kind of performance. What's it about? <laughs> and America talks about, you know, uh, the rule-based order, and yet what's going on in Gaza is completely contrary to any version of the rules-based order. But at the same time, we don't have an international authority to uphold the rules-based order. So it's a terrible tragedy because we've got this awful war going on in Ukraine where, I, in my view, the West is not providing sufficient support and Russia could win, which would be terrible. And winning doesn't necessarily mean capturing all of Ukraine. It just means undermining Ukrainian democracy. And then we have this, what I think is rightly called by many as a genocide, in Gaza, the horrible attacks by Hamas, followed by the genocide in Gaza. And we don't see any end to it. It actually seems as though it's strengthening both Netanyahu and Hamas, this process. And it's an endless war. And I, I really liked the way both Sarah and Ricardo pointed to the fact that wars aren't linear any longer. They're not, they go on and on and on. They have their ups and downs, but they never seem to end. So where do we go from here in this very grim situation? And as sort of activists and scholars, I just want to draw attention, I think, to two issues where we might make a difference. I, the first is back to my point about human security. I think we need to push for a shift from national security to human security. It's really fascinating to me that in its Madrid new strategic concept uh, announced in Madrid last year, NATO announced that human security, women, peace and security and climate change were now integrated into all of its role. <laughs> now the question is, what does that mean? Um, and um, I think they do mean protection of civilians, but it's got to mean not just that protection of civilians is a nice thing to have when you do normal military operations, which is international humanitarian law. It means that protection of civilians is the goal. And uh, how do we get that across? And the interesting thing, I think, is that Ukraine, for many in NATO, was a wake-up. Somebody, a senior official said to me, we suddenly realized that in reality our strategy depends on millions of civilian casualties and it's unacceptable. So I think there is a moment, and particularly with the strengthening of the European pillar, when there is a possibility of shifting from national to human security. And what does that mean apart from all the economic and social issues which we ought to be talking about, what does it mean in military terms? Well, I think it goes back to the classic principles of general and complete disarmament, which you actually mention in the book. It means that military forces are either required for peacekeeping, or I would put it to protect civilians in times of crisis. You know, maybe we need peacekeepers in Gaza. 
and for de purely defensive purposes. And we should be thinking about what that means in terms of military structures. So that's one issue I think we could talk about. And the other issue, I think, is the political economy of all this. You know, when Dan and I were doing stuff in the 1980s, everybody was really interested. And in fact, I've forgotten her name. Somebody was pointing out that I'd done something for the General Assembly on the conversion of defense industries. We felt that we had to understand why the arms race continued. Why does the US suddenly, why does the US do airstrikes, whatever happens? <laughs> why does this go on happening? I mean, I would say it's not just the defense industry, it's the dominant geopolitical security culture in which the US is embedded, and there are all these structures. But hugely important are the defense industries are now linked up with tech companies, now with the war on terror, linked up with intelligence agencies, and much more interconnected, particularly the US, the UK, and Israel. So I think we don't do enough work on this structure and how to change it, because until we can sort of shift the... It, shifting from national security to human security is not just about shifting military posture, it's about shifting kind of embedded structures. And I think we need to be doing more research about that to go forward. And finally, I would say, I think we need a new nuclear disarmament movement. I mean, Russia's threats in Ukraine have really drawn attention to the dangers of nuclear weapons. We're seeing modernization in the US, in Russia, in here in the UK, even if it doesn't work, and a huge waste of money. And uh, it is time. It's really weird that people aren't more worried and upset about what's going on in the nuclear field. So there's a sort of agenda for everything, but thanks for the book, because it's a really important contribution. Thank you very, very much, Mary. Um, it was a little depressing. Um, <laughs> so, so, that, so I can lighten the mood by saying what I forgot to say earlier, which is I think you're all very welcome at a, a reception after it's outside. Um, but despite, despite the, the gloom, and it's very real and, and, and very um, substantiated, I think what's, what's kind of really interesting about all, all of our speakers is the emphasis in the midst of all this pessimism that they have put on the possible, on what can be done through collective action. And I think that's, that's really, really key to, to, to what we've been listening to, to tonight. So um, can I just open the floor? There is a roving mic uh, or two, and there may be questions online as well. So we'll, we'll try and go between those. And please introduce yourself and wait for the mic. Well, you, you again, yeah, this. Uh, hello, my name is Ho Ryung Jin. I study the developments in SOAS. And then thank you very much for opening your nice speech. And then I really think this um, one of the reasons of rearming is a feeling of insecurity because the rhetoric of uh, Russia, they are saying that uh, NATO was expanding like five times. So everyone is engaging this defense theory from their justification or from their positionality. And then Europe, for the same reason, they say, before we thought this peace continued, but uh, now they start buying these arms from Korea or the USA is selling more arms. So the, my question is how we can deal with this growing insecurity because you know, that as long as these people who are pushing the politics or the strong men, they are in front and they create this political capital of insecurity or this resentment, collective resentment, then uh, if we don't deal it, then we cannot have this accord between states. Secondly, how can we revitalize about this platform as the UN? Because before, somehow, in new war, UN worked uh, for enforcing this disarmament or peace building. But uh, because of these two wars, uh, Ukraine and uh, Palestine, it really 
vanished this uh, authority of UN, and then you know that. So maybe you have to think about the sudden platform of reinforcement. Maybe civil society, but the one of the biggest challenges people are many very much focusing on migration and green energy issue. So how we can make another issue and attract attention of uh, this population? Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, should we intersperse? Is there, is there a, a Zoom question? Uh, do you want to take to a batch of three or so? Yeah, yeah OK. Uh, we do have a question from the chat asking, what is the current relevance of international organizations other than the UN, so for example, BRICS, ASEAN, to advance the humanitarian disarmament agenda? Uh, hello, uh, I'm Shio Ryono. I'm, I'm learning development studies here, and uh, I'm so impressed by all your speech because I was working on my undergraduate thesis about the relationship between Japanese government and TPNW in 2017, which was kind of disappointing. And I, was two, I, ha I have two questions. Uh, firstly, in terms of TPNW, like what will be the ICANN or another like initiative's next strategy to like move forward TPNW? I, believe, I strongly believe in the power of people uh, for realizing humanitarian disarmament, but due to the current international legal framework, it is still not effective. Like, uh, so I mean, like in, we need to in, uh, include like state actors, especially in nuclear states. So what could be the long-term, mid-term strategy to uh, make TPNW like effective or more efficient? And my second question is on um, what could be an um, like expectation or hope uh, for Japanese citizens um, to contribute to like realization of TPNW, because like uh, we are only the country who ha who suffer from like the nuclear dis uh, nuclear arsenals in war times. So and then I uh, my another dream is kind of like to contribute to these like nuclear disarmament as a global citizen. So I would like to just like to I'd like to bring back some learning from here, like to my uh, country's like friend or colleague also. Yeah my question. All right, somehow we have five questions for you there. So, so who, who'd, who'd like to have a, have a go first? Matthew? Take the, the TPNW question. Right. So um, thank you. So the TPNW um, is the treaty to, uh, on the prohibition of nuclear weapons that was negotiated at the UN um, in 2017. Uh, it, uh, has, it was supported by 122 countries that voted for its adoption um, and is in the process of, 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 of ratification now and has had two meetings of state parties. Uh, it does not include the states that have nuclear weapons. Um, they boycotted the process. Uh, but what I think is interesting about it is the way that it has decentered nuclear politics within the UN by sort of the states that don't have nuclear weapons taking the initiative to, to push forward a stigmatization of, of, of nuclear weapons um, without the nuclear armed states being involved. And I, I, I hesitate to accept the, the framing that the TPNW hasn't done anything. I think it's done quite a few things. Um, one is that there has been, uh, the, the treaty includes pro, uh, provisions on victim assistance and remediation that are borrowed from the landmine and cluster munition treaties. Um, and um, we've already seen the TPNW essentially become a forum for talking about the effects of nuclear violence on affected communities. Um, and the, the development, too slow, but nonetheless happening, of a new normative framework for dealing with the legacies of nuclear weapons. And that sounds like it might not be relevant to disarmament, but I think it is, because it really is highlighting the, what nuclear weapons do to human bodies. Uh, too often our discussion of nuclear weapons is, is in this kind of abstraction of deterrence and who has what missiles and how big they are and what uh, the numbers associated with them are. And it's recentered the conversation on like, what does radiation do to human bodies, which has been so long obstructed by the nuclear armed states that, that the answer to that is that we actually don't really know <laughs> in much depth because there's been so much secrecy and so much obfuscation in the, the, the medical field even. 
um, for instance, all our models um, on uh, how radiation affects bodies is based on a, a, a model of a human being who is a, uh, literally, I'm not uh, making this up, or, or on a, a European man who's about five foot 10 um, and um, like uh, has a Western European diet. Um, and of course, most people aren't that. Um, and so uh, we are seeing the uh, a re-examination um, of this whole field of, of radiation health, of the impact of, uh, of nuclear weapons on people. And I think in that, I see the possibility for agency because we can start by talking about nuclear weapons as real things, not imaginative like um, speculations and uh, like, uh, but as actual devices that hurt people. And even in nuclear armed states, we are seeing um, old structures that actually date back to the 80s, like the nuclear weapons free zones, um, are starting to, like in New York City, we have actually adopted legislation that aligns the old nuclear weapons free zone that's still in existence, is still keeping nuclear weapons out of the harbor, by the way, actively is being used. Um, we've confirmed that. And is aligning it with the TPNW. So I think that within nuclear armed states, there is possibility for agency at the sub-national level. And what can Japan do? I think Jap Japanese people could do that within Japan, right, to reinvigorate things at the sub-national level, but also to engage in solidarity. It's fascinating to me that we have not treated nuclear testing communities with the level of regard that we have mine-affected communities. Why is there no mines advisory group for nuclear affected people? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think that um, that's something that people in Japan and elsewhere could be, could be starting. work? Yeah. yeah. Um, so there were several questions, but I don't know if you want me to answer them all. Um, the, this question about nuclear expansion and insecurity, I mean, I think that has everything to do with what I was saying about the shift from national security to human security. At the end of the Cold War, people like me and Dan hoped that both NATO and the Warsaw Pact would be dissolved and it would be replaced by a pan-European security system based on the, what are known as the Helsinki principles, the combination of human rights, economic and social cooperation and territorial integrity. And of course that didn't happen. And of course NATO expanded and I was very much against the expansion of NATO because NATO was a geopolitical alliance and not a human security alliance. Having said that, I think it was entirely a pretext for Putin. It was not the reason. Um, and so I think the big problem with national security, and it's very interesting if you look at civil society debates going back to the 19th century, because they make the same argument. Rousseau makes the argument, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, that uh, prin princes go to war really in order to s repress their own citizens and that the argument about an external threat is the argument of national security is always used as a way of suppressing opposition and that's one another reason why shifting from to human security makes democracy more possible is very important. And then somebody asked, well, where is um, change going to come from? Is it the BRICS? I guess it's the, the human security states. It's countries like Japan, Canada. <laughs> we would like to think the European Union, but we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, I think South Africa's initiative on genocide was hugely important and quite a big breakthrough in the development of international law. So that whole alternative way of seeing the world has developed since the 1990s and hasn't gone away and is there for us to build on. And then a final point I wanted to make, I forgot to mention the fact that I am a member of the Sec UN Secretary General's advisory panel on disarmament. And over the next two years, we've been given the task 
of looking at the impact of new technologies, artificial intelligence, robotics, space, cyber, and producing a report on what the UN should be doing. And, of course, in all these cases, you can think of positive things to be done, like robotics for mine action, for example, <laughs> or, you know, how you could use AI to counter the disinformation that's happening uh, in a very frightening way. Um, or cybersecurity in a way that's defensive and protects human rights rather than is used for national security. So there's lots you can say about all that, but I think all of those issues really are important for everybody to discuss. So if anyone wants to send me ideas, I'll be very grateful. <laughs> please, please, yeah. Um, yes. So I follow up a little bit. On <laughs> I will start from new technologies because actually, um, despite uh, despite our name uh, that I know it's Mines Advisory Group, uh, it's misleading. But uh, we do work in mine action, but uh, from uh, um, around the, I mean um, around the mid of the two thousands, we started to work also on weapons and ammunition management and uh, small arms small arms control. And um, and there is a, in that field there is a lot of uh, there are a lot of talks about new technologies. Uh, unfortunately, the kind of instinctive way of approaching new technologies is about manufacturing because actually it's a terrible trend that now it's getting easier and easier to produce a pistol with a 3D printing, mm -hmm. which cannot be tracked, uh, or other ways to actually evade uh, the typical ways in which uh, small arms are controlled, the circulation of small arms are controlled. But actually, what, what uh, Mary, you just, uh, you just mentioned, uh, new technologies are also worth being, being thought in a positive way. Mm. Uh, for example, on uh, the development of sustainable national capacity and uh, international cooperation and assistance, like you, ju you just mentioned about robotics for for mine action, but also uh, sometimes the new technologies in these two fields I just mentioned uh, sometimes are really are much more basic than what we think. So, for example, when we speak about cybersecurity, it becomes a necessity if uh, we want to control uh, uh, the uh, the circulation of, of small of small arms through through virtual or informatic. Inf informatic record keepings that sometimes are necessary uh, when we have states affected by climate change because they they tend to be some states tend to be affected by flooding or uh, a, a soil erosion and so pa paper based record keeping is not cannot cannot be a cannot be an option because they got they, they get ruined quite quite easily in those conditions so that's actually an, an, exa an example of new of the new tech new technology that, and cybersecurity becomes vital because then uh, you need to defend that virtual record th those rec record keeping that are necessary because of climate climate change unfortunately um, one thing I wanted I wanted to, to, to speak about uh, the question on um, the, the different uh, different realities. I, I, I suppose it was the, from 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 the chat, from the chat. So when we speak about, uh, I mean, my understanding from the question is that we are speaking about organizations in a bro in a broader sense. Uh, but definitely, when we speak about the UN, we have to remember that uh, the UN is uh, the international community, and we do have a lot of processes that involve all the state, all the states. So we don't. No, I think uh, that. Uh, when we look at the UN, we tend to associate that to the secretariat, so the UN agent, the UN agencies. But all the the, the politics, uh, for example, from from the Conference on Disarmament, and uh, and all other collect the General Assembly, the UN General Assembly, those are actually states with different different groups and dif different different ideas. Most of the times, those states, and this is actually something I really want to emphasize because we do work, as MAG, we do work a lot with regional regional international organizations, like, for example, the ECOWAS or CARICOM Impacts, 
for the Carib for the Caribbean, ECOWAS is for West Africa. Uh, those are key actors because uh, I mean, being sm being smaller, they tend to have to to to, to agree, <laughs> but in a in a much more e in a much easier way on some points. And uh, and actually, most of the times, groups of states or actually specific states, uh, like me, I one example that I have in mind is Costa Rica. Uh, Costa Rica is a, is a champion on 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 this uh, on disarmament human human security based disarmament uh, and uh, and they are really I mean despite the size of their diplomatic service around the world they are impressive if you follow them on on, uh, on social media you will see what uh, what I'm talking about another another in very interesting states uh, on disarmament is for example uh, is Ireland Ireland was behind uh, uh, one of the latest uh, humanitarian disarmament campaign, which is the INU, uh, INU campaign against uh, explosive weapons in populated area, areas that ended up uh, in, uh, in a declaration, uh, the WIPA declaration, expo uh, uh, explosive weapon in populated areas declaration, which uh, actually I think it's a good example of what <laughs> Mary you were, you were saying, because uh, uh, if you read the declaration, uh, the, the declaration clearly states that I, IHL is the minimum, but then uh, there is a concept of human security which, ten, which uh, aims to expand the protection, the protection of civilian points. For example, at the fact that uh, you, <laughs> you can, I mean, uh, some, uh, some uh, objects that can be seen uh, according to certain interpretation of IHL as legitimate targets like uh, infra essential infrastructures or, uh, or, uh, or other, other, other uh, infrastructure that are essential to the survival of the population, I mean, cannot, sh should not be targeted, okay? So if you look at that, that process, it's a, it's a very in an interesting one. Unfortunately, I mean, between the signing of the declaration and now the next conference that will happen in April, I mean, a lot of things, linked to explosive weapons, a lot of sad si <laughs> things uh, related to explosive weapons, starting with, with Gaza, I mean, uh, have happened. So it's going to be a very interesting, uh, sadly interesting conf conference uh, in uh, soon, in uh, ne next month, actually. So that's actually another interesting process yeah. to follow. Yeah. Um, Dan, Dan, you've done so much work on the UN. I wonder whether you've got something very brief to say on prospects for revitalizing. <laughs> Um, ah, brief. I'm a professor. Don't do brief. <laughs> <laughs> don't, do, don't do brief. I'm a professor. Um, I think we have to, re when we think about human security, uh, the people who defeated fascism in the Second World War created the UN system as a conflict prevention human security system. The first meeting of the Food and Agriculture Organization had the banner Hunger Made Hitler. The assumption that you mass unemployment. Uh, unregulated financial markets were principal causes of the Great Depression and World War. The architects looking at the present system would only wonder why we haven't had much greater war already. So what we don't do is to take that system seriously. A lot of my work has been around rediscovering what I would call the radical 1940s. And that those lessons are there if we choose to, to implement them. Um, you, you talk about the insecurity and it's goes to the heart of it. A lot of it, I have to say, is male insecurity, uh, masculine insecurity, the one has to deal with. But in our own cities, if all you do is invest in the riot police and the SWAT team, then that's all you use the whole time, because the neighbourhoods are burning down. And I think we understand that you have to uh, invest in community development and community policing if you aren't going to have uh, the neighbourhoods in flames. And that is the principle we need internationally. Uh, in our own small way, uh, perhaps the attention of uh, the UN Secretary General, if we are able to get a new uh, initiative uh, on disarmament, hopefully the book that my colleague I see at the back, Dr Samuel, has helped with on open source investigations in the age of Google um, enables us to say, and excuse the very own academic language, the boys can't hide their toys anymore. Putin's attack was not a surprise. I didn't think he'd do it because I didn't think he'd be so stupid because he couldn't win. 
but it wasn't that we, it was a surprise. His or forces were entirely visible. And our book contributes to this discussion of security through transparency. Uh, and that, I think, is an, is an important component. And other things that we bring to the table, too. Uh, Japan, uh, I have to say, I think astonishingly few people know that Japan outlawed gunpowder for 200 years. I think it's an extremely powerful example uh, of saying, actually, societies, for the reasons of social cohesion, I'm not saying I'm a supporter of the samurai and the shogun <laughs> in any shape or form, but for reasons of social co cohesion, gunpowder was eliminated from society so they could carry on slicing each other up with those very sharp swords. But lest there be any uh, confusion on my part, I do think the Ukraine absolutely has the right of self-defence and that we should do everything possible to help them. And I concur with, uh, with Mary on that point. Anyway, I really want to hear from Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you had it be the mind, and I'm too uh, egotistical to turn it down. Yeah. Um, is it on? Yeah. 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 I, I think my, my response is, uh, for, for, uh, especially on the question on what we can do, I think there's examples uh, when you look I think, and we were speaking about this earlier, um, about the incremental change that happens when you know uh, uh, groups of people get together and 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 start a movement. So we already seen, for example, with the with, with the use of mines that are banned, that when they are used, wherever they are used, there is an uproar, there is a condemnation, and there is a collection of evidence to show that uh, people are breaking the international, you know, they are going against international humanitarian law. The same as uh, the cluster munitions. So there is, uh, wherever there is a movement, wherever there is a, 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 a disarmament issue that, uh, that, is, that has already uh, gotten to the point where it's a, it's a treaty or it's, it's been implemented, there is uh, efforts that, or, or, or ways in which uh, the communities are now demonizing the use of this equipment. Uh, uh, this uh, weapon. So effectively, I think it's not a lost cause. Uh, it might be slow, but it's incremental and, and, and it saves lives at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've got time if there's like, let's just take a, my goodness, <laughs> there's lots <laughs> more. Uh, you have to limit us to 15 seconds. Right, exactly. So can you think of asking one question each, not two each, for starters? And then I'll control this bunch afterwards as, as, <laughs> as well as I can. So, uh, yeah, up, up there. In the red. In the red. Can I ask them? <laughs> okay. I love your point on human security. And so my question, because I think we can all agree climate change and human security are super interconnected when you look at food and everything like that. And so when you bring up things like AI and cybersecurity, which use incredible amounts of electricity, um, which is coal, like in the US and Europe, I believe it's coal. So how do we balance kind of the need for nuclear, nuclear disarmament with the fact that nuclear energy is our most promising way for a sustainable future? And so that is something. That one, Great question. question. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Next one. Who, do, who else did we have? We uh, just in, in in front of uh, uh, in the back. My question has to do with um, social movements and activism, and I'm just wondering why, when looking back on the past, things like Green and McConnell are common, where thousands and thousands of women were able to gather and actually bring some kind of progress to nuclear disarmament or some kind of, or project you know the momentum to say that this is a dangerous thing what happened why aren't we seeing that today mm. is there a general complacency is it the political economy that's making people fearful mm. why is it a generational gap that we don't live as much in a world aware of yeah. these kind of conflicts. So from your experience, I'm wondering very what you think. Question. That's the Thank reason. you very much. I think we have one. Do we have one down here? Yeah. Yes, the gentleman down here, please. Thank you. My name is Nigel Elway, and um, Sarah and I are both directors of a small NGO called the Revive Campaign, and we're very much in the advocacy um, arm of Mine Action. Sarah and I were at the um, House of Parliament yesterday at an event at which we had three parliamentarians, one of whom looked as if he'd gone into the wrong room. Um, 
if we want change, we really need to get parliamentarians and polit politicians on our side. And uh, I, I spend a lot of my time talking about the politics and diplomacy of uh, mine action and victim assistance. And it's an uphill struggle. So um, more of a comment than a question. Mm. Thanks. Thank you for that. And then there was one back there, and then there's one online, I think. Yep, you. Both of you, if you like. Quickly. So I, um, this is for Mary. I, you, earlier you said that the U.S. has just lost legitimacy. Um, what do you think will happen to the legitimacy of the ICJ and other international courts in the future? Was the lady right? No? Okay. And then, uh, Manuel, you've got one from... We actually have two questions. Well, you can ask one of them. <laughs> uh, the conflicts in Gaza and Ukraine also raised the argument for military intervention to stop the victimization of civilians against the government of Israel and Russia, respectively. Is this argument aligned with the humanitarian disarmament agenda? Right. Who, who would like to? Sir? No, yeah, okay. yeah. We'll go Sir, one from, we'll, from you. you we'll, we'll, start, we'll, we'll just go one by one down the line. Maybe sure. one question of 15 seconds. And then there'll be no time for you, Dan. So. I can <laughs> take some of the climate change stuff. I think that um, in answering a couple of questions, I think that it isn't that somehow... Um, quote, unquote, younger generations aren't politically involved. I think they're involved a lot in the climate change question, um, among others, and the struggle for racial justice. Um, and it's that uh, perhaps um, we need to make clearer the, the intersections between disarmament and those movements, um, and that violence is often racially um, inflicted um, that climate, if, if you look at, for instance, Runit Dome in the Marshall Islands, um, where there is nuclear waste from both the nuclear tests in, in the Marshall Islands and also Nevada, um, that is uh, cracking and um, being inundated by the rising seas. So you see, like, there, there can be connections. I think we have to be better, perhaps, at, at politicizing them and making them um, known to... to, to um, our political leaders. ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, um, very carefully uh, uh, distinguishes between nuclear power and nuclear weapons. I, I think they're um, very distinct and different um, issues. One is a, the uncontrolled explosion of, uh, of nuclear um, kind of reactions, um, and one is, uh, the other is um, the use of nuclear energy for, for peaceful purposes. I'm not convinced that nuclear energy is the, the answer to climate change. I think that's a, that um, underestimates the regulatory problems of getting nuclear, nuclear energy plants going. Uh, they, ha they tend to run into regulatory problems and they're really expensive, whereas um, uh, there are lots of other alternatives that we could be turning to. Um, but to distinguish, I don't think nuclear disarmament is going to stop nuclear power plants, and it shouldn't. They're not, they're not related um, issues. Well, I'll, I'll pick the question about why aren't we doing much. I think there is uh, enough, that, uh, there is quite a fair bit that is being done. Uh, and I wonder whether the, 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 the way it's happening is uh, maybe different from the times when Dan and Mary were uh, uh, carrying placards. Although I think I see that quite a lot. There is a lot of, um, I think with, with the social media, there is quite a lot of uproar. There is quite a lot of evidence collection that happens that, uh, you know, that, that makes government may hopefully state questioned or, 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 or mobilize, you know, uh, and, and, and do things differently. I think there is, enough, uh, there is quite a lot that is being done. I, I see, especially even from the um, uh, environmental movement, you know, the, the school, uh, you know, younger generations uh, joining in and being part of that, I think there is, but of course, as, as, as everybody has been saying on the uh, whatever on this uh, panel, there is not. Uh, I think the problems are multiplying, and there is not enough people who are uh, engaging in that. But there is enough, or there is some that uh, something that is happening uh, in terms of campaigning against uh, some of these issues. And it's not like, for example, when we say, um, if you think about the landmines campaign or the the campaigns that that we are speaking about. 
uh, it's not like when the treaty is uh, uh, gotten that that stops. Actually, the harder work uh, continues. Uh, the landmine issue is kept alive by, for example, the landmine monitor, which is published every year that shows exactly what each state is doing uh, in regards to uh, their responsibilities, in regards to victim assistance, and that is on record and everybody, um, uh, for, for everybody it's launched every year, isn't it? Every year it's launched. I think it also <laughs> combines now the cluster munition treaty in terms of adherence. So there are some efforts, but I, I, uh, as we all see uh, from the world today, I don't think uh, it's enough yet to, to solve some of the challenges. I just, I mean, I just echo what, what, what Sarah was saying. I mean, probably one issue, one issue is that it's really, I mean, a lot of very, com very complex. And also, uh, we have also to deal a lot with uh, uh, the, um, how appealing every issue is, because uh, uh, just I want to follow up on the comment. Unfortunately, in MAG, with, in our advocacy, in our advocacy work, it's not uncommon to find uh, to find the, our interlocutors saying, oh, landmines are still a problem because they are kind of boxed in a, 19, in a 1990s scenario. And like Sarah was saying, the, the, the adoption of the, uh, of the APNBC, the Mine Ban Treaty, uh, is, uh, has been seen as a sort of a uh, of, yeah, of finish, finishing line. Mm -hmm. So definitely, F, we do need a lot of <laughs> a lot of a lot of work. Also, for example, adapt, to adapt those treat those treaties. Right, right now, for example, we have a, uh, an, an, an an emergency that is not really at the top of the media on the use of improvised landmines. So landmines that are built not industrially, uh, and so they are much more difficult. And the, the, the treaty, I mean, we are working on adapting the treaty to that. So. Also, if you want to remain informed, I, I equal what, uh, uh, on mine action, I equal what uh, Sarah was, uh, was mentioning, but also the fact that we also have mine action review. So that's another overview on uh, what other national, auto national authorities around the world uh, do. I want just to conclude something that for me, it's, uh, I think it's a good summary. We do really need uh, solidarity and empathy. So we need to, when we speak about the principle of humanity, that means addressing human suffering wherever, wherever it is found, it also should mean to all of us that the suffering of uh, the community uh, cut out by minefield is actually my suffering, despite I'm uh, in a comfortable, uh, com sitting comfortable in London or, or, or Manchester, I think, uh, I mean, going, Technicality, yes, but also these kind of values that they might be, they might sound simple, but they are deep, they are deep and they are nece necessary and we don't see them so, so much. So I, this is <laughs> my conclusion. Thank you. Um, I just want to answer two questions. One is the question about why isn't there a powerful anti-nuclear movement? What's the difference between Green and Common and now? And I think... It felt, at the time, very immediate. We were in the middle of the Cold War. Uh, we really, f the Cold War had sort of un unexpectedly heated up again when we thought it was over. <laughs> and we felt we were in the middle of it and we still felt quite close, actually, to the Second World War. So, you know, the idea of a more horrible Third World War seemed very immediate. What I think is alarming is that, and I've written a lot about this, is that we see a different type of war now, which isn't like the kind of war we thought about, which is becoming more and more widespread and never ends. This is what we were discussing, that there isn't much difference between war and peace mm -hmm. in large parts of Africa, large parts of the Middle East, large parts of the Central Asia. And it's gradually encroaching on all of us. And I think, I would argue, it's an extreme form of militarized neoliberalism. It's the consequence. I mean, it's not, it's the consequence mm. of a combination of inequality and the rise of crony capitalism. I could go into it at great length. But I think it's, um, so in that sense, 
Dan's points about hunger are absolutely right. I mean, you know, when you get situations of extreme inequality, when young men have no choice, they have no proper jobs, so they can either become criminals, they can join an armed militia, or they can p perhaps survive on humanitarian aid. It's not a, it's not a choice in these situations, and it, it, it just grows because it expands through transnational criminal networks. I was just being told about a sort of incredible, uh, the way Syrian states becoming a narco state. Mm -hmm. And it expands through crime, it expands through refugees and forced migration, it expands through humanitarian networks. And I think we all ought to be much more alarmed about all this than we really are. So that's, I don't know how we develop the kind of empathy and solidarity, which I absolutely agree we need to do because we do now live in one world. The other point, the question I think was to me about I'm advocating military support of Ukraine <laughs> and maybe peacekeeping in Gaza. I just think human security, there are still some uses for the military in cases of genocide, massive violations of human rights, forced displacement, um, aggression. You have to defend people. You can't just let them be the subjects of that. But how you de defend them is very important. I mean, military action has always been about defeating an enemy. To say that it's not about defeating an enemy, if possible, you arrest them, actually. <laughs> it's about making sure that civilians are safe, requires a real rethink of how we do military operations in a quite substantial way. I don't think either Kosovo or Liber Libya were that. They used conventional military forces to try to protect people in those circumstances, and it had all sorts of problematic consequences. So I am for military. I think there are cases where military force is required, but we have to rethink. It's much more like policing than like classic war fighting. Very quick three points. Uh, some years ago, I wrote a book which is in embarrassingly large quantities in the SAS library called The Beauty Queen's Guide to World Peace, which some of my students came and told me they found very useful and easy to read. So that's one answer. The second is our banner, scrapweapons.com, uh, uh, you can uh, uh, contact us and see what we're doing about uh, global weapons control. Uh, I'm sure if you're good development studies and politics students, you'll have read, you know, your Gramsci and your Foucault and uh, ideology. Uh, well, if we are, if you are, and we all are, in uh, an ideological structure, and if we are uh, looking to challenge it and break out of it, it doesn't feel comfortable. If it feels comfortable, it isn't working, which is not a very good point, nice point to end on. But we're not ending because there's some booze out the door, I think. Doing, doing my job for me, but thank you. <laughs> so so uh, thank you all for, for coming and for the really superb questions, actually, at the end, really, really probing and, and relevant questions. And I'm sure you'll join with me in thanking uh, our distinguished guests um, for, for their very, very insightful um, comments. But So that's to Dan, to Mary, to Ricardo to Matthew, but above all to Sarah for convening and, and, and helping us be here and organizing such a distinguished and brilliant panel, and as well as your own contributions. So thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Can we see you outside? <laughs>